Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your patience in holding. We now have your speakers in conference. Participation in this conference call is by express written invitation of the HRET only, unauthorized participants, and or any party that assists unauthorized participants may be subject to substantial criminal and civil penalties. If you have not been invited to take part in this call, please disconnect at this time. Please note that all lines are in a listen-only mode at this time. At the conclusion of the presentation, we will open the floor for questions. At that time, instructions will be given as to the procedure to follow if you would like to ask a question. It is now my pleasure to turn today's conference over to Erin Craig. Ma'am, you may begin. Thank you. Good afternoon and welcome to our educational webinar for ARC Safety Program for Ambulatory Surgery. This is the start of our checklist series and it is titled, How Fertile is Your Soil? Building Upon the Culture in Your Center. My name is Erin Craig and I will be your facilitator for today's event. We are pleased to provide you with one CME CEU for today's webinar, and the planners and faculty of ARC Safety Program for Ambulatory Surgery have indicated no relevant financial relationships to disclose into, in regard to the content of this activity. Now, some of you were with us on our last webinar, but we do want to introduce you to uh, those who weren't able to join us to our new platform. Like you all, the national program team here is also on a path of continuous improvement so we are trying to better meet the needs of our participating facilities and improve our webinar services. So with this, we are transitioning to our new platform, but I do want to let you know quickly a little bit about some of its features. You have, I first want to make note that in order to make the most out of your experience, uh, if you are dialed in through your phone, we recommend that you mute your computer speakers. Otherwise, you will hear through both speakers and have some feedback. So this um, muting your computer speakers, if you are dialed in through your phone, will avoid any of this confusion. Also on the screen, you can see that you're able to change your status. And what I want to point out here is that you can raise your hand. So if you have a question at any time, this, uh, this will allow you to reach out to us and that we can, we can get to you. I also want to point out the chat box that you'll see at the right-hand bottom side of the screen. If you have, we encourage questions and participation throughout the webinar, so at any time, please put a question here. You can see that I've even put in this chat box the link for today's slides. So we do encourage you to, to talk to us and ask us questions throughout. So with that said, we'd like to start with a a poll for today's session so that we can learn a little bit more about everyone that's joining us today. So first, do you work in an ASC? Second, are you represented by a management company? And it looks like, there we go, great. And we have the first one open. And the second one, are you represented by a management company? And third, what is your professional background? So please check all that apply in case there's multiple people on your, at your center on the webinar. So are you an administrator, an anesthesiologist or CRNA, a circulating nurse, infection preventionist or control nurse, scrub tech, surgeon, other technician, or other? And the polls are now open, so please feel free to register your vote. I'll see some people are voting, so. Looks like everybody has put in their vote. Thank you. So with that said, it's my honor and pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Bill Berry. As we start this checklist phase, we are very fortunate to have someone like Dr. Berry with uh, such a knowledge and expertise in utilizing the checklist to create a culture of patient safety. So with that, welcome Dr. Berry and thank you for joining us. Thank you so much, Erin, and thank you everybody that's taken the time to call in and, uh, and spend some time with us for the next uh, 45 minutes or so. Um, this webinar marks a, a little bit of a shift in gears in the program. Um, the first part based heavily on improving infection control practices and the next piece of it on leveraging the surgical safety checklist to, um, whoa, 
all of a sudden things jumped ahead there. Um, leveraging a surgical safety checklist to help improve teamwork and communication. Thank you. All right. So I like to start off all the times that I have with, um, with you by going back and touching a little bit on what's happened up until now. And you can see, um, you can see on this slide that a number of different, um, uh, different topics have been touched on um, through the infection control portion um, of the curriculum of this project. Um, project data requirements, infection prevention techniques, using a team approach to reducing infections, and, and you can see for yourself all the things that have been touched on. We asked you through that work to think of some things that happen at your center, reviewing the infection control practices that you follow, assessing the use of immediate use cycles at your center, considering using checklists to inc co increase compliance with standards, guidelines, and recommendations, and finally to administer a culture survey. So one of my jobs today is to take what we want to work with you on for the, for the next few months and actually show you the map, the, the map forward and the path that we want to take you on to help you, again, improve communication and teamwork um, in your centers. So today we're going to talk about culture survey results, um, and I'm going to ask you a question in just a minute about um, results from your own center, which some of you, um, I think, have just received in the last few days. We're going to talk about how a well-used checklist can help us close some of the gaps that a culture survey might identify in a center. And then finally, I want to give you an overview, again, of the path that we're going to um, take you on as we work together over the, the months that are ahead of us. So half of the facilities started administering a culture survey in November of 2014. So there's a bunch of you who have been at this for a while to the point that a handful, uh, more than a handful, about 30 ASCs now have gotten reports back of what the culture survey showed. There are centers that have not yet completed the process of doing the culture survey. And like I said, some of you have received your culture survey results very recently. So um, I'm going to need some help with the poll. But um, I wanted to ask you a few things about your culture survey results. The first question, were you surprised by your culture survey results? And here you see a handful of ways to answer that. Obviously, you can't answer it at all if you haven't seen it. Um, but if you have, you can tell me yes or no that you were surprised or not. So we'll wait a little bit until everybody gets a chance to vote. It, it looks like there's a handful who haven't taken it yet. Some are still in the process. That is almost half of the folks. Um, haven't received a report yet, haven't had a chance to look at it yet. And then um, of the folks that have opened it up, which are the top two, it looks like a little bit more than half opened it up and weren't particularly surprised. All right, that's actually the fact that you're not surprised isn't terribly surprising, depending on how close you are to the folks who work in your, in your centers. Um, some managers are very, very close, work in the operating rooms themselves, have a really good finger on the pulse and the culture of the survey they work in, and it's not surprising that they're not surprised by what other people think about the culture in a given center. I want to spend the next little bit talking about why I think culture surveys are important. And here you can see um, two fields. Um, one uh, filled with crates. It's actually a picture, I, I think, from someplace in California, probably the, the Napa Valley. And, and you see on the bottom slide uh, just a bunch of thriving grapevines. And on the top slide, uh, some grapevines that um, aren't doing quite so well. 
And the purpose of showing you these two things is to say that the way that the culture is in, in a particular center has a lot to do with where a center can improve and, um, and what a center has to work with in terms of where it sits right now. So there are people and centers that are well along the path to making communication and teamwork and infection control practices a real piece of the work that they do every day. And, and there may be quite a few centers that are like that that are listening in on the call today. And then there are some places that are just at the beginning of the journey. And, and to me, the culture survey is a real way of understanding what's going on in your center because you get to hear the voice of the people who actually work there, understanding what some of the problems and gaps might be, and then to think creatively with that in mind about how to improve some of that when it isn't quite what we might want it to be. So I'm going to share with you some results from more than 1,000 surgical team members derived not from culture surveys that you all just did, but from culture surveys that have been done earlier in this program. So these are real results. They're from real ambulatory surgery centers filled out by real team members expressing their feelings about where they work. So what you're going to see is very much a, a high-level view. Everybody is like pulled all together here. It's not looking at a, at a single center. So in these 1,000 team members that gave their surveys back to us, there may be centers that, that have none of what I'm going to talk to you about. This very much is looking at, at the average. And what I want to point out to you in particular are gaps that exist between what the people who are called staff, so those I'm going to divide people into two piles, that work in centers, one the physician pile, and the other one the pile that has all the rest of the folks in the center that make it work every day. And as I go through these results, I want you to, that first, that's the way that they're divided. And, and second, that, and it's, again, it's probably not surprising to you, not everybody sees what goes on every day or what the issues in a center are um, through the same lens. Not everybody agrees even in centers that are very good, that everything is perfect all the time. So this particular question, staff are treated fairly when they make mistakes, is a very, I think, a very important cultural question. And the big reason why it's important, I think, is probably obvious to all of you, because if, if people don't feel like they're treated fairly when they're honest to mistakes that are made in the work that they do, then what they do in response to a mistake that they make is try and cover it up. So what you want to see is that everybody feels like they're treated fairly when they make mistakes so that they'll come forward when a mistake is made and you can actually do something about it to prevent it from happening again. And here you can see not a small gap between what physicians who work in the centers felt and what non-physicians or staff who work in the centers felt. And this is important because what it says to me is that the physicians are looking at what treated fairly means in, in, in a different way than a lot of the other folks that work in a center. What we would like to see here is that both of these bars are at 100%. And clearly, particularly on the, the staff side of the equation, there is a considerable gap that we want to close. We want people feeling so comfortable in a center that they're going to be treated well if something happens that could be prevented in the future that they'll actually tell us about it. Okay. Let's see. Our facility allows disrespectful behavior by those who work here. It looks like a, a word got dropped in the title there. Again, you can see a not surprising difference in the way that that's viewed. So the physicians in particular think that the amount of disrespectful behavior that is allowed is actually pretty low. That could be for a whole bunch of reasons. One could be that they don't see it, 
at all. The other could be that they don't believe that behavior that other people consider disrespectful is really disrespectful. Almost 30% of the rest of the folks that responded to this survey, so that's three out of 10, thought that there was disrespectful behavior that was actually tolerated in their center. And, and I think one of the things that we know for sure in terms of the way that employees perform in their jobs, the, the, whether they are proud of the work that they do, whether they um, keep working at a given center for an extended period of time, a lot of that has to do with whether they feel respected or not. And this says that respect towards each other can sometimes be a problem in ambulatory surgery centers. Now, I want to also tell you that these patterns are common across all of healthcare. Um, my guess is it's not just confined to healthcare either. It's probably common across all workplaces. But the ambulatory surgery center environment definitely shares these same kind of pro problems with people feeling safe to admit they had a mistake and that they're going to be respected when they work. I think this one is, is a really interesting one. And again, it, it shows that it matters where you stand, what you feel. We feel rushed when taking care of patients. Um, here again, you can see that on the physician side of the equation, that uh, not very many physicians feel rushed when they're taking care of patients. And if you flip it around to the other side and talk to the nurses and the surgical techs, and, and my guess is probably some of the nurse anesthetists and, and maybe even an anesthesiologist or two who got lumped in with the physicians, that there are times when they feel that, that time pressure to move quickly. And I can tell you from work that we've done in the state of South Carolina with hospitals there that using a checklist really well without changing anything else can actually make people feel less rushed. And I think part of the reason for that is that if you follow the checklist and really follow it every single time, it makes you feel very certain that a lot of the most serious mistakes are much less likely to occur. People feel that extra safety as actually things slowing down a little bit, when if you put a clock on it, there may not be very much difference. But people's, the way that they feel when they use a checklist, they actually feel like they're more in control, even though the pace is pretty quick. This is a gap that um, is hard to close in the ambulatory surgery environment, because it could very well be that the, one that the person that's pushing really hard to have the staff go quickly is the, is the surgeon, and it explains why this gap looks the, the way that it does. But I can tell you that in this particular, um, in this particular instance, a checklist can actually make a difference. When we see someone with more authority doing something unsafe for patients, we speak up. Um, again, I, I think you probably no one out there is surprised that the physicians feel like they have no problem speaking up. Um, authority, gradient, or no, that um, actually to them, there probably aren't very many authority gradients that they have to overcome. But for the other people that work in a center, for almost 20%, of the folks who were surveyed before you, that was an issue. Um, now, I, I, you know, I don't want you to take the wrong message away from here. 80% of folks, that authority gradient doesn't matter, and they will speak up. So if you're thinking to yourself, there's nothing that would happen in my center where I wouldn't speak up, no matter who I saw doing it, um, that it really doesn't make a difference. The fact that there are 20 people who, or 20% of folks who show up here who wouldn't do that says that there's a, at least a reasonable chance, even in your own center, that there are people who are reluctant sometimes to speak up when they see somebody who's doing something that might be a little bit dangerous. And we really want to help people overcome that, right? We want everybody in the center to be the defender, the advocate for the patient, and the defender of the patient's safety. 
key information about patients is missing when it's needed. Again, you can see that there's a, a marked discrepancy between what the physicians believe and what non-physician staff believe. Part of this, I think, is because some of the information that's actually missing doesn't make the physician's job all that much harder, or the physicians may not even notice that it's missing. That 30% of the staff sees that this is an issue is probably because they're the ones that are having to close the information gap somehow. If a patient shows up and there's not a proper consent or some piece of information is back in the physician's office, the burden of that ends up many times on the staff that work in the center and not on the physician. And that's probably why this looks that way. But one of the things that, again, that we believe that moving to things like checklists in the preoperative, intraoperative, and postoperative periods can help solve some of these information problems that people encounter and close this gap some. So I think this is interesting and to me is a little bit reassuring across ambulatory surgery centers in general, and that is there isn't a huge gap between physicians and non-physicians about how people feel they work together as a team. Um, that, it, to me, is very, very heartening. Before the start of the procedure, all team members stopped to discuss the overall plan of what was to be done. Again here, not huge gaps. So when things get kicked off at the beginning of an operation, people actually feel pretty confident that everybody is ready to go. What is missing in that space a little bit is what, something that we think is really, really important. And that is that the physician um, that's doing the procedure actually gives permission to everybody else who's standing there to speak up if they say something that concerns them. Now we know from a lot of the bad things, the really bad things that have happened in operating rooms across the world, that oftentimes someone is standing in the operating room that sees the train coming and for one reason or another doesn't feel like they can speak up. Um, so this gap around whether doctors encourage that kind of speaking up, I think is one that um, we should try and close and try and close together. And the checklist that um, we would like to help you put into place in your centers, the, ones that, the one that we want to move you towards, actually has a part of it that addresses this particular problem. Immediately after procedures, team members discussed any concerns for patient recovery that they had. Here again, a major disconnect between what physicians believe and what the non-physician staff actually believes. So that, you know, the physicians think that the communication around the patient passing from the operating room to the post-procedure recovery area, whatever it is that you call that, in your center is in much better shape than the people that actually are probably primarily responsible for moving information back and forth. And again, this is something that we think a well-implemented checklist can actually help you with. Give your facility an overall rating on patient safety. And I think this is very interesting to me because it shows yet another gap. And, and, and it's not a huge gap, but I think, um, I think it's something that even the best centers probably need to work on or want to work on. So when given the same range of choices between poor, fair, good, very good, and excellent, physicians tend to rate the center where they work more highly than the staff does. Um, and it's interesting. And I think it, you know, the physicians are probably in the place where we'd like to have everybody. Actually, we probably would like to be able to give this survey and have certainly have no one say that the center was a poor place. But we probably 
don't even want very many in the very good pile. We would like to have everybody be able to say they work in a place that's excellent in terms of the patient safety. And not everybody is there yet. So I think this slide in particular is a very, very, has a very important message in it. Physicians that work in centers think that they're really, really, really good already, and the staff thinks that there's at least some way to go. And we want to help you close that gap by improving the way that people feel about the safety of the patients that they take care of every single day by actually improving that safety. So this is a question that we get all the time from folks. So I think there's at least 20 centers out there, and some of you may be on the call right now, that have their culture survey results in hand, and a handful of you said that you weren't surprised by what you saw. I'm going to guess that most of you who feel that way got back pretty good culture results. So you could turn around to me and ask, well, why should I bother doing any more of the work with you? We went through the improving infection control in our centers, and actually we were pretty good there too. Um, it was interesting information to hear, but we really didn't change very much. So why should I even listen to you for the next several months and do any more of this work? And I think the answer to that question is uh, I have never, ever worked with any healthcare facility that couldn't be better, not a single one. There's nobody out there that does everything perfect every single time for every single patient, and every single staff person has complete confidence in every single thing they do. It just isn't there, even in the places that are really, really good. And you and many of you may run fantastic surgery centers. Actually, for those of you that do and work in places with really good culture, I would ask that you stay with us and work with us for the whole rest of the program, if for no other reason than to help the other centers out there that aren't where you are yet, because I think you all have a lot to teach. But dropping back from that, I think everybody can get better, even the best can be better, and what we would like you to do is to stay with us and work with us and see if you get some ideas from what we have to talk about over the next few months that can be helpful to you in your center to make it world class um, if it's not all the way there just yet. All right. So I want to stop for a second and listen to a recording that we did um, just a bit ago. So if, uh, if my technical experts there can get ready to queue up this recording. This comes from Dr. Dwight Burney, um, who works with the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons. But the cool thing to me about Dwight is he is an orthopedic surgeon, and he actually works in an ambulatory surgery center environment. So he's going to talk to you in this little clip about why he thinks this work is important, and, and, and part of that is because of stuff that he learned when they surveyed the culture in his very own center. So are you guys ready to play his clip for me? Aaron? We are. It's just, I believe... First of all, in the way of background, um, I was in a private practice orthopedic group, and our group owned an ambulatory surgery center, and the vast majority of surgical cases there were performed by surgeon owners uh, that were myself and my practice partners. At the same time, I was involved with physician communication training with the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons, and we were working on a team training project with the AAOS. And as part of that project, I had become a Team Steps Master Trainer in May of 2011. The management company that manages our ambulatory surgery center, which is USPI, conducted a version of the uh, AHRQ uh, safety culture survey at all of their facilities yearly and benchmarked each facility against the USPI averages. In late 2011, these results were reported to the surgeon owners of my ASC. Um, I was disturbed by what I saw. Some of our scores seemed to be very low. 
Um, after seeing the results of the survey, I tried to educate myself on safety culture surveys in, and the value of them. Uh, what did they mean when you saw these scores? And also, I tried to learn more about what was a safety culture. So to go back, part of uh, the things that really concerned me um, was our, uh, on our survey in 2011, the overall assessment of patient safety had 20% uh, D and E scores, which were poor or failing. Um, USPI averages were 5%, and AHRQ uh, averages for our region were 3%. We also had very low score on non-punitive response to error and communication openness domains. And being uh, very interested in communication as uh, a vehicle for uh, uh, safety and quality, this caused me a great deal of concern. Um, as is typically the case, our administrators scored uh, safety, uh, the overall assessment of patient safety, much higher than the staff did. And AH, as I learned more about this, uh, AHRQ says this is pretty typical, is that the administrators really don't have an idea, the same idea of safety as the people actually working uh, with the patient. So in part of my uh, um, studies about uh, trying to learn about uh, safety culture, I came across uh, information on high reliability organizations um, and uh, the importance of uh, so-called mindfulness, which I think in Team Steps is uh, probably corresponds most closely to situational awareness. Um, and this comes from high reliability organizations such as nuclear power plants and commercial aviation. Uh, so in my own practice, I tried to uh, eliminate distractions from my OR, and I really missed having the music, but I realized it was a distraction to me. Uh, the whiteboard in my OR was not kept current, so I insisted that it be kept current, um, I, and I started conducting uh, preoperative briefings with the OR crew, um, and I insisted on conducting the timeout myself. Uh, in response to our safety culture scores, we formed a culture of safety committee among the staff at the ASC to explore the problems that the HSOP survey was uh, uncovering. We've been meeting regularly for two years now. Um, I had offered to conduct Team Steps training for our facility, and uh, I, we subsequently had 14 Steps fundamental workshops for our surgeons and staff. Uh, we are currently in the process of initiating uh, a quality improvement project with to use brief or debriefings, excuse me, um, and that has just started. And so uh, um, we've made some efforts to try and uh, attack the problem, or at least define and attack the problems, and also try to improve our quality by using um, briefings and debriefings. Fantastic. Yeah, let's see. Um, I want to go to the next slide and poll you about sharing your culture survey results, but I want to reflect for a second on, on what Dr. Bernie said, and I think there's a couple really important messages that we'll, we'll come back to in a minute or two, but one of them, he describes a path that his center was on, a path that was started by taking that culture survey, and it un, un, it, it it unmasked a whole bunch of issues in his particular center that I think the, the physician owners were unaware of. And everything that I've showed you up until now would have predicted that physicians aren't nearly as in touch with what goes on amongst the staff as the staff actually are. And that explains all of those gaps that I, um, that I showed you. But, I mean, he also talks about very positive things that the culture survey actually got them doing, working on a better briefing, working on eventually a debriefing, um, and then working on helping people learn how to speak up better. All those things are really, really important, and, and they're actually built into this program. So we've heard Dr. Bernie and many other people like him, and, and we honestly think that taking a, a checklist um, to drive some of this improvement is actually a great way of getting it done. 
So now, if, Aaron, if you can help me with the poll, um, this gives you a whole bunch of different boxes that you can check, and you can check as many as you want. So whether you've gotten your survey back or not, you're eligible to check a box here and tell me if, if you have had done it already, how would you want to share it? And if you've gotten it back, um, how do you want to share it? I know one of the problems Dr. Bernie has encountered in his own center is a reluctance on the part of the administrators to actually share some of this information sometimes. Um, so let me know what you think. When you get your, your answers back, how are you, what are you going to do? Everybody knows they took this thing. Are you going to tell them what they, what they saw from their answers back to you? So it's still moving a little bit. Fantastic. Well, t to me, again, this is um, this is really heartening, and um, and I'm going to share it with Dr. Bernie the next time that that I see him to see a big zero in the bottom box, um, which I think is fantastic, because some of the power of this, again, whether your center is at the top or whether your center has has some work to do, part of the power of the whole thing is feeding back the information, being transparent about it. You know, and if there are gaps identified, great opportunity to engage the staff. And if, if you're really in a pretty good place, a great opportunity to, you know, to reward people for being in a great place and then to encourage them to work to make it an even better place than it is today. Anyway, thank you all for taking the time to um, fill that little poll out. So now um, in the program, we're going to officially shift gears from all the things that we've done before and actually start to talk about the checklist and where we would like to take you. So where we want to go is using a checklist meaningfully for every patient every time they have a procedure done in the facility where you work, okay? And we're going to talk to you about what that means and then give you, share some ideas with you about how to actually do that. So we know we've been working now with a whole bunch of ASCs. Um, um, you're a whole brand new group to us, but there have been a bunch of people who have come before you, and, uh, and they haven't been shy about reminding us that for many of them, using the checklist is a CMS requirement. So we know that many of you, I won't say all because there are centers maybe on this call that aren't CMS certified or don't want to do CMS cases, but many of you use a checklist in some way. Um, so we know that right out of the box. But we believe firmly that everybody can get more out of the checklist. Um, again, I have been in many operating rooms in many different settings, actually all around the world, and, and I, I haven't been to a place that was 100% perfect every single time. So everybody's got some work to do. And that's the work that we want to help you with. Because we believe that a well-designed and used checklist can do a whole bunch of really good team, of really good things for your team. Help us do what we know needs to be done every time for every patient. Ensure that we have the necessary information to take the best care of the patient possible. Maybe close some of that information gap that we saw exist in some, in some centers. Give every member on the care team a voice. That whole thing about being able to speak up if you see a problem, being able to know that you're safe in your environment, to admit that you made a mistake so that you can keep somebody else from doing it. Build stronger and safer teams because I, I know that, that we believe it and I think most of you know and understand in your heart doing surgery is almost always dependent on a team. Sometimes it's just two people, but almost always it's more than one. And having a really good team is an important part about giving great care. Make patients feel safe and involved in their care. So we're going to touch a little bit later on in, in the program about creative ways of even involving a patient in the checklist. I can tell you that when I had surgery last, I was involved in the first part of the checklist. At the 
outpatient facility where I had my surgery. Provide a means for continuous quality improvement. There's a way to track things using your checklist, and we'll talk about that. Create buy-in and engage physicians in quality improvement. One of the things that we know for absolute certain is the places that use their checklist the best have their physician staff engaged in the way that the checklist is used every single day. And that's a huge challenge for many people. And finally, I think one of the things, and, it's, and to me it's one of the selling points to the physician staff, is that you can actually improve the efficiency of your center by using a checklist regularly all the time, particularly if you can get to the point where you're doing really good debriefings, where you're fixing the problems that are encountered as you go instead of having the same thing happen um, that slows things down multiple times before it finally gets fixed. So this lays out the map. I said I would share one with you, and this is it that shows you all of the different things that we're going to touch on as we go through this. You can see now that we sit there right in the February box, sharing culture survey results. We're going to talk to you about recruiting the team, understanding the work that we have ahead of us, customizing and testing, expanding the work if you work in a center that has more than one operating room, conversations and publicity as ways of spreading the word across your center, training and expansion, watching and coaching, and then finally what some people call sustaining, but I like to say you never stop looking. So the way to make sure that like the checklist becomes part of the way that you do work isn't just Medicare saying you have to tell us you do it or we're not going to pay you. It's that you always keep an eye on how it's going in your own center, and you commit yourself that the checklist, just like some of your infection control practices, are things that you never, ever, ever look away from. Um, I, I tell a lot of people that I look at where we're trying to get something like a checklist is in the same place that those of you who work in the operating room know that respect for the sterile field is. Everyone in the operating room defends the sterile field. We want to get in that same place around improving communication and teamwork through the use of a checklist. Getting the most out of the checklist series takes some work, some work on, on your part, and we know that some of that work is really hard. So we ask you to do as much of the work after each webinar as you possibly can. We want you to bring ideas and challenges that come up to, to places where you can help get answers. So if we ask you to do something in your center around the checklist and you didn't understand it all the way or you're really struggling with it, you're coming up against some barriers that you're really finding it tough to get around, tap into one of these resources, the learning groups, office hours, or, or calls with our quality improvement advisor. Emily George, and Emily's going to talk to you in, um, in just a minute about some of the things that, that she has to, um, has to offer you. But please reach out for help as we go through the rest of this. Ask questions and finally give us feedback. Because one of the things that we're trying to do is learn how to do this better too. We know that, that we can be better in everything that we do in how we deliver all of the ideas that we have, and then how we help you actually do some of this work in the center. So I want to turn this over now to Emily, who's right down the hall from me, to talk to you um, about things that um, have been learned from the learning group thus far. So Emily? Yes, thank you, Dr. Barry. So we had, um, we wrapped up our first round of learning groups um, the last week of January, and it was so great. Thank you to everyone that was able to, to join those calls. We had um, some great conversations around quality improvement projects that we're doing um, at facilities and ways that those work. And so um, I just highlighted three things here that kind of came out of those conversations that I wanted to share with you. And we will be circulating another document with good ideas that were taken from that in more detail. But the first one was just um, selecting quality improvement projects that staff, providers, and patients will really find meaningful. And, um, and then secondly, finding creative ways to engage staff and providers at all stages of the project. 
and some of the ways that facilities are doing this are through one-on-one -on -one conversations um, and staff meetings, and preferably with food. We found that um, food is a great way to get people to listen to you. So if you can, if you can provide that too, that's a great way to get um, everyone involved in there and having a, a conversation. Um, the third is just setting clear objectives, communicating your timeline, and then reporting that progress regularly. And we heard that facilities do things like weekly dashboards, um, email updates, anything to just really um, send the inf information back to the people that have been providing it to you, and um, just getting everyone on board with that. And so um, secondly, too, I just wanted to mention that we're going to be giving you hints as we go through the checklist series on how we can use this work for accreditation requirements. And we, want, we really want to help you do something really meaningful to improve the care of your patients and improve how things are done in your center. So uh, more on that to come. And then um, lastly, I just want to give a brief overview of things that are coming up. So we'll have one-on-one um, -on -one check in calls late March and early April. And I have most of those set up with you guys. But if for some reason we don't have that set up, um, feel free to shoot me an email and we can get that on the calendar. It will be great to just touch base and see how the program is going for you. Um, our next round of learning groups will take place the last week of April. And um, on, on those calls, some of the potential discussion topics will be um, the culture survey results. And um, we'll have a couple more webinars coming up. And those are going to go over speaking up using structured language if you had um, a concern. And then also getting more into using a safe surgical checklist. And so, um, there's going to be a lot to cover, but it'll be really fun to get you guys on the phone and kind of hear how everything's going. And then lastly, you can email me at any time or give me a call. Um, I've, I've had several of you just pick up the phone and, and call me to ask questions, and that's great. So I really welcome that and encourage you to do that. And um, Jeff and I are, are here to make this meaningful for you. So that's all I have, Dr. Barry. Thank you. Thank you so much, Emily. Well, I like to close the calls that, that I have with you periodically um, with a handful of, of take-home messages. And I, I've, I know I've said it probably too many times over the course of this call, but no matter where you are, um, you can be better. I think we all know that, and, and we very much want to have you stay with us and work with us to help make the care that you provide in, your, in every single one of your centers as good as it possibly can be. And sharing the culture survey results can help us begin to begin to move down that path towards improving things for the better. And you know, like I said, I'm very heartened to see that there was no one there who who doesn't want to share with their staff in one way or another the results that they um, that they've gotten back or will get back from their culture surveys. I think that's an incredibly important first step. Where are we? and being very, very transparent about that. So there is some homework. And, um, and for those of you who already have your culture survey results back, um, it's something that I think that is most easy for you. If you haven't done it, um, I encourage you to finish up doing the culture survey um, so you can get it back. But when you have the culture survey results, use them to identify areas for improvement. And again, if, if you come out and everything on there is absolutely, absolutely perfect, please stay with us, um, both to help the other centers get where you are, but also to take little things away that can ma make your center even better, even if you don't have gaps in the culture survey. Share the culture survey results with others in your center and think about all the ways that you can do it and when you should do it to help your checklist effort. I think the bottom line is it's really important to share the results back. Think about how the checklist can close some of the gaps in your centers. We are going to spend a fair amount of time talking about how to look at what you do now, how to improve on whatever checklist you have in place in your center, and how to move that checklist towards helping to close gaps where you have them and to make things even better in the places where you don't. So I'll turn it back over to Aaron again. Thank you for spending some, some time with me. I look forward to, uh, to talking to you again in a month or so. Um, and please stay with us in the program.
Erin? All right. Thank you, Dr. Barry. And before I go into a couple wrap-up items and the ability to allow you guys to ask some questions to Dr. Barry, I do want you to think of those questions. Um, we will be opening up at the end of the call so that you guys can speak directly or you can be typing those into the chat box. So um, we, we have that open. I can see that, you know, it, for instance, one of the questions is about, say you haven't received your culture survey, then you can always contact us at ASC Safety Program at AHA.org. And we will be getting to all those questions, but I do want to encourage you to think of those and begin asking those while I do a couple of these wrap-up items. So our next uh, upcoming educational event, your checklist implementation team and learning how to speak up using structured language. Again, this is March 4th, and Dr. Barry will be joining us for this one as well. So we have some great news. We have a new resource now available. It's our ASC toolkit. So we have four educational modules on our website, the first being coaching clinical teams, second patient and family engagement in a surgical environment, improving teamwork and communication in the surgical environment, as well as sustainability. We encourage you to go onto our website to uh, access these modules and to check them out because we think that uh, they are a really great supplemental material for this program. Again, we encourage you to always ask us questions at any time should you have any help. Emily, the Quality Improvement Advisor, had, had, pardon me, had provided her email earlier, but you can always come to our website or with data collection questions, you can go to HRET Data Support or come to us with clinical and program questions at the ASC Safety Program email. So I do want to remind you that we are offering continuing education credits for today. And this uh, website will look a little bit different for all of you that might have been receiving them in the past. So not only are we providing the link here, but you will receive it at the end of today's webinar, as well as in an email communication. So just to give you a little preview of what, what it might look like differently. So we have the new screen, so this, this will look different. And they're going to encourage you to log in. And you might need to create a profile if you haven't already done so. So I'm going to be providing the instructions on the next slide, but I just wanted to give you a little preview of how it might look different. And some benefits just real quickly to this updated system is that once you create this profile in the system, you will only need to log in with your username and password the next time. So you won't go through the process of recreating each time for each webinar. And a list of all the courses you will be taking will be shown in your profile. And third, all the certificates that you might have received moving forward from this webinar will be stored on this site so they can re be reprinted at any time. And I know that this is quite a long list, so hopefully you can print this out, but it, it does seem um, hopefully uh, to your benefit that uh, you will have the stored certificates available to you at any time. So with that said, I do want to open up for question and answer. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. We'll now open the floor for questions. If you would like to ask a question, please dial the star key, followed by the one key on your touchtone phone now. Questions will be taken in the order in which they are received. If at any time you'd like to remove yourself from the question queue, please dial star 2. Alternatively, you can use the chat function in the lower right-hand corner of the web presentation to ask your questions. And again, to audio questions, star 1 now. And I do want to call attention, we do have some, some great communication going on in the chat box about some people that might uh, not know where to find their culture surveys. So Evan has let us know that the culture surveys can be assessed in the resources section in CDS, and he has provided the link in the chat box. So for any of you that might not have been able to review it prior to uh, the webinar, then we encourage you to do so. Have any other questions? I'm showing no questions in the phone queue at this time. If you would like to ask a question via the phone, please dial star 1. Again, we encourage you, if you have not received a culture survey, that you contact the ASC Safety Program, and we can make sure that we see to the next steps to make sure that your center receives those. All right. 
thank you all for your participation today, and this concludes today's webinar. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. This concludes today's conference. You may now disconnect your lines, log off your webinars, and have a great afternoon.